I'll just. So uh, with that, I will just uh, uh, welcome everyone and uh, hand over the floor to our our speakers, uh, Dr. Tununuche and Dr. Rudabashuka. Please, uh, um, we look forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Hello, everyone. I am Nicholas Tununuche. As uh, Dr. Taylor has uh, uh, introduced me, I am with uh, my senior colleague, uh, Dr. Simon Rutabajuka. And our presentation uh, tonight is about landmarks of migrant labor along the Western route uh, in Uganda since the 1920s. I'm talking about, uh, we are talking about the Western route uh, actually, uh, I'm happy that I can see uh, Professor Samuel Rangar Nigo, who uh, documented very well the two kinds of uh, the colonial Uganda, uh, the labor reserve zone and uh, the cash crop reserve zone. So as the way of conceptualizing it, we had the this uh, northern and uh, the eastern part going to uh, plantation uh, in the eastern Uganda. And then a very big, as you can see the volume uh, uh, here. Uh, the volume here heading to Buganda and uh, as later we, we are going to see uh, shifting to Toro and this uh, 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 particularly in, in Kirembe. Uh, so that really presents our main introduction and we are uh, operating or we operated in that context of uh, the two kinds of uh, zoning, uh, which continued, of course, up to, uh, 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 up to recently uh, in the uh, 1990s, but officially it's, it had stopped in 1935. And we are going to see the reason why it had to continue uh, despite the fact that it had officially been discouraged in 1930s. So the, this presentation or paper is the component of a larger project between the Department of History, Archaeology and Heritage Studies of Makere University and the University of Western Cape. And it aimed at documenting the history that exists about the people who used the camps uh, we are going to talk about and uh, about those camps themselves, how they have constituted the heritage of Uganda. And uh, uh, referring to the Western uh, migratory camp uh, or migratory route, it is this uh, from uh, here in uh, Kabare, passing through uh, Mbarara and the one here at Ruti, then we made a survey which indicated uh, Sanga, Riantonde, Mbirizi, Masaka, Rukaya, Mitaramaria, and finally Mpiji. Uh, but through our, our readings and uh, from the experiences of migrant laborers, we note uh, that these camps uh, performed two main aims. Number one, they served as the recruitment uh, centers, and number two, as transit camps. Uh, we got 
all that from uh, mainly the archives uh, in the uh, in Kabare, the Chigese uh, uh, the Kabare district archives, uh, and uh, we collaborated with the national archives. Then all the histories, and we have focused on the two campsites that is Kabare and Ruti. Kabare being uh, the recruitment, uh, one of the main recruitment uh, centers or recruitment camp that is associated with uh, the personality called SCAD, and then Ruti, uh, which also performed not only as recruitment, but more uh, importantly as a transit camp. So uh, this uh, person uh, you see in the in the photograph is uh, one of uh, of the major respondents who owned land uh, where the, uh, the the the, uh, the cavalry camp uh, was uh, was uh, established. So um, we therefore uh, focused on those two, and our talk is really uh, based on those two camps, the Kabare one and the Ruti one. So of the major findings, we note that uh, the sources of labor were uh, um, counties of entire Chigese district. And Chigese district, we are talking about uh, the counties of Ndorwa, Rubanda, Ruf uh, Bufumbira, Chinchizi, Rujumbra, and Ruchiga. Uh, th that archival document, uh, though not quite visible, but it identifies a number of people coming from particular uh, counties that used uh, Chigezi or uh, the, the camp that was owned by SCAD. And that camp is now known as uh, Ahakempu, but uh, it is uh, of course uh, related with uh, uh, the camp, Ahakempu camp to mean a camp, and uh, when we did uh, uh, the, the interviews with uh, that uh, gentleman and uh, Fulgens, that gentleman is called Binigwa, uh, uh, the, the, that area is popularly known to them as Waskad. Waskad referring to uh, that uh, very, very uh, tireless, uh, a colleague to them who had learned Ruchiga and uh, uh, really associated with them. So Waskad has been part of not only their history, but also a major important area of heritage. We noted the role of chiefs, which was very, very critical and important in the recruitment process and tracing the deserters. Uh, recruitment was done by the chiefs uh, on behalf of the company, uh, Chigezi Recruitment Agency, which was part of the bigger company of Uganda company. Uh, we noted that uh, uh, two branches of Uganda company operated along the Western route. The one of Chigezi Recruitment Agency that was operating in Chigezi under SCAD and another one which was Massacre Recruitment Agency that was operating at a Massacre Camp. Though uh, we did not see the traces at, uh, at Massacre, but when we do much of uh, the research, I think we shall 
get much more. For today, we are really focusing on those two. So the sub-county chiefs here uh, would uh, go into uh, their respective sub-counties, then uh, mobilize laborers, uh, whether by some kind of coercion or uh, voluntary, then they would uh, convene at uh, the Gombora headquarters. If they became many, SCAD would uh, dispatch a lorry, otherwise called Rubao, and then uh, pick those members and brought, and brought them in the camp. At the camp, they spent less time. They, uh, uh, because SCAD was in one way of a go-between with the, uh, uh, the areas of employment. For instance, the children the mines, uh, uh, the, the, the government in, uh, in Uganda, and also the wealthy Uganda, uh, the wealth peasants uh, like Vyandara in Uganda. So really the sub-county chiefs uh, compared to county chiefs played a more and prominent role. And these sub-county chiefs were uh, interacting very well with uh, the, the colonial administrator at the district. And that was the, the district uh, commissioner. The district commissioner uh, became very, very critical when it came to the point of desertion. Because when the complaints uh, came up as some kind of too much need for labor and many recruiters, and yet SCAD had been given uh, the overall uh, powers in charge of recruitment in, uh, in Chigezi, the DC became very concerned and he had to issue out this guideline. Uh, I will just, uh, since it is not uh, very visible there, I will read um, uh, uh, this paragraph two, uh, which was the, the discouraging uh, the massacre recruitment agency in, uh, uh, in Chigezi. Massacre recruiting agency in capital letters and underlined. This recruits labor for the sugarcane estates at Rugazi and Kachira. They are not allowed to recruit porters who live in Chigez. Uh, the commissioner underlines not, uh, not allowed to recruit porters who live in Chigez. They are only allowed to recruit immigrant labor. That is people who are passing through Chigezi from the Congo and Rwanda. Further, uh, furthermore, their recruiters may only operate in the following pieces near Kabare and from Kabare to Kamuganguzi, Rwene, Maziba, and uh, Kachwekano. So the letter was uh, from the DC informing all the Saza chiefs and all the Gombora chiefs. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, um, uh, overpowered and then uh, SCAD decided that contracts be made and these contracts uh, could be followed and then signed by the DC and the lawyer. And this would compel migrant laborers 
from escaping from their places of work and uh, before their particular time had reached. We display uh, one of the typical contracts which was actually made uh, uh, um, legal and adopted in the whole of Uganda protectorate. This was so because migrants or migrant laborers from uh, Chigezi uh, were much needed not only in, uh, in Uganda, Toro, uh, and in uh, Kirembe mines, but also the local demands, especially mines in Rwanda and from the county. With us not that to control the whole process of mobility, camps were used extensively as recruitment and transit sites. So uh, we, uh, with those main findings, we now turn to particular camps. And we start with uh, the Kabare camp, and then we shall end with that at Ruti. The Kabare camp, which we have uh, said it is Owaskad or Ahakempu, was uh, was and is the, the uh, is located at Mwanjari, Chikunjiri, Katuna Road. Uh, uh, this uh, this was uh, got from archives. This uh, uh, sketch map, which was given to Scud when he was asking for land. Uh, let me see whether. Aha, uh -huh, it is visible here. And uh, this photo is what we made uh, when we were at, uh, uh, at the site. You realize that uh, the camp is, locate, uh, is located along this Kabare uh, Katuna Road, uh, uh, which is here uh, on someone riding the border border. And uh, this is uh, the road that uh, uh, is heading to what was called Ndorwa Strip. And now it is moving up to Mwanjari Market. And uh, it, it, it became a very big camp uh, to the extent that it even passed the road and uh, occupied this bigger space. Uh, so the buildings that have uh, ends taken over from the camp uh, are located both sides here and here. But you can see that initially uh, it was located uh, here near the, uh, the European cemetery. This European cemetery is now uh, uh, is now occupied by the market and uh, the Nigua told us that uh, it, it was recent in 1970s that uh, the four big, uh, uh, big graves that were joining this road were removed by the council to establish, the, uh, to establish that market. But uh, he told us that people seem to shy away from it, and that's why even up to now it is not uh, uh, it is not built on. Uh, but uh, the the main one, this plot site, uh, it was taken over uh, by some Kasigazi, uh, and uh, Kasigazi first established a bakery on it. And then later on has established a, a, a milling factory and uh, 
and that he is related with uh, Mukombe, and Mukombe is one of the main uh, administrators of uh, the Ngorogoza time. And uh, uh, actually, the Ngorogoza time is much related with the resettlement of the Bachiga outside the Chigezi district. But that is uh, another story uh, from, uh, uh, from the perspective of migration to other areas, another form of migration altogether. But we note that uh, uh, this camp, we, uh, uh, as they noted earlier, was owned by Uganda company and managed by camp, uh, Cabaret Recruiting Agency, KRA, which is very much associated with SCAD and coordinated by or controlled by district commissioner's office. The land where it was located uh, uh, was grabbed from uh, uh, the father of the Nigua and actually uh, it, it was inherited and he told us that uh, if probably they had a land title, they would uh, uh, he could have got some money. But as he was trying to establish a simple garage because he had got some education from uh, the Indians, uh, he was told that it was given away to SCAD and SCAD had started building uh, 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 the tent-like houses and those tent like houses uh, we got to know that uh, they were uh, inputs uh, which are currently uh, on the lower side of the administrative building of uh, Chigezi uh, of Kabare local government at Makanga. Uh, we have also photos which uh, we shall share later on um, after the presentation or in the course of the presentation, if they are valuable. Now, the, uh, we therefore noted that indeed the colonialists kept looking at Chigezi as a very important source of labor and hence the role of the Uganda company and it's uh, uh, very hardworking uh, in the Fitiye Gebo uh, scourge. And Chigezi remained a reserve of the laborers for Uganda and Chirembe, as the, we have seen in the directive of, uh, of the DC. And this site is still known as Oaskadi, to which the archival information vividly referred to referred to regarding to the main state camp administrator called SCAD. And the idea of a uh, camp in the local language, uh, it was adapted as a uh, camp, camp, uh, uh, those who are very uh, well versed with the, the Ruchiga, a uh, 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 camp is Nyankore, then a uh, camp is, uh, is Ruchiga. So it forms the part of their heritage. So uh, this, is, uh, this one we have already. Now we turn to Ruti, which is also a very interesting uh, camp, but quite different from uh, uh, Chigezi or Kabare one. And we noted that uh, the information about this labor camp in uh, is quite is quite scanty uh, because unlike the Chigezi one or the Kabare one, uh, where we 
fully utilized uh, uh, the archives in uh, Kabare. They are, uh, they are an unfortunate part of, of, of Mbarara was that the archives were destroyed in uh, 1979 war. But uh, when we reached at this center here where it was located, we were able to trace those who used it and those who saw it operate. And among them was Vaguma, uh, who gave us some narratives. And those narratives were, uh, were uh, that currently it is Mbara Regional Technical Support Unit, uh, commonly known as uh, uh, rehabilitation, and that it is very well known to the uh, to the locals as Agaba Nyarwanda. And uh, Agaba Nyarwanda underlines its historical origin as a Nyarwanda labor migrants transit camp as opposed to the recruitment camp. And we really noted the interaction among the transit migrants and the communities surrounding the camp, which resulted in two intermarriages and permanent settlement of some of the Banyarwanda in the Ankole region. And uh, up, to, up to now, uh, 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 it is used as a, a meeting place for, uh, 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 for, for the local people. And later on, uh, in the 1960s, 70s, it was uh, used as a refugee camp before being a rehabilitation center. The Agaba Nyarwanda was a refugee camp uh, throughout the uh, uh, 60s and 70s. So people, uh, the, the refugees would first uh, be monitored from this camp before they are transferred into either Nachivare and many other areas. And in here, the locals were able to interact with these refugees. And at times, they would pick some spouses in, from those refugees. And therefore, we noted some kind of strong interaction between uh, this camp here and the, and the locals. Um, to them, indeed, it is their memory bank for their, uh, for their history and their connections with uh, the, the, the transit migrant laborers. Uh, we noted some of the gaps uh, during the process of our study, and therefore we uh, we present uh, some of them uh, here uh, before we see the gaps. Yeah, we noted that it would be beneficial to study the entire uh, the entire route. Uh, but at least the, 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 the four of them be studied uh, uh, so that the, the narrative can be very, very complete. And we, we suggested or we suggest the, the camp at, uh, at Masaka and the, the camp at Impiji. During the course of, the, of our study, we noted an expansion of labor migration in two total area, and particularly in those key estates, Kirende Mines, uh, the railway extension to Kasese, and these are hardly researched on. And from the very first map we showed, uh, 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 
we showed a very big volume of migrants heading to that, uh, uh, to that region or to that area. Methodologically, uh, we noted that uh, the necessity of looking through in those sub uh, uh, uh Gombororas where the migrant laborers had a stopover, especially those old ones, like the one at Chinoni, that there, there could be some of those archival documents uh, are kept there. Uh, and those that are nearby, uh, are nearby Mbarara, those Gombororas could be of help uh, to produce the required, uh, the required documents about the camp, not only at Ruti, but also throughout, because from the archives in Kabare, we were able to map out and do a survey of those camps, and particularly the report by law. Law was uh, uh, a labor officer whose, uh, uh, whose recommendations uh, these camps were established. And the recommendations were that uh, the whole of the route, the conditions should be bettered so that people are allowed to voluntarily join the process of labor migration without necessarily using coercive forces uh, or, 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 or that, that necessitated the, the zoning system as pointed out by Rwangari Nigo. So we really uh, recommend or point to the gap of this methodological uh, uh, inadequacy to which if these are brought to the table, we can have a better and a more uh, inclusive and impressive uh, narrative. We noted that uh, whereas we, we had set or the whole of um, the colonial period has or had uh, in a way had already established some kind of neutral ground to have the migrant laborers uh, uh, move at their own pace and at their own will voluntarily uh, kind of migration, uh, we noted that Ruwaro kind of labor, which was kind of forced, still existed. And perhaps that explained uh, a fire on Ruwaro to be exclusively in Kiswahili, which a, a, a language that is completely alien to the local population. And uh, 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 when I, for instance, uh, I, for instance, looked at uh, point number two on that, uh, 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 on that uh, document, it was a letter from the district commissioner, uh, uh, just as the uh, information would do me. It shows that Ruwaro was still practiced in the district. So we think that if this file is actually translated into, uh, into English, a very 
good paper about rural type of labor that existed after the after it was legal it was illegalized or outlawed it would be a very important aspect in the study of labor mobilities as a way of conclude of concluding we note that uh, african labor was important in the colonial economy beyond labor reserve and the cash crop zoning framework. We also conclude that uh, labor demand and recruitment for East African railways expanded to Kamwenge and Kasese, Kirembe Mines, tea plantations in Toro and Buganda. And the, uh, there were particular employers to that effect as uh, they are not quite clear, you know, these things of archives, but uh, we were able to do some simple uh, scan. The whole of this, the whole of this here is the list of the employers that used the camp at, uh, at Kabare to recruit for them for SCAD to recruit for them migrant laborers. So when we have uh, uh, um, the connections made, for instance, by Middle East, uh, um, Middle East consultants, it is not new therefore, because Middle East consultants could be uh, uh, the, the, the SCAD, the SCAD of the time except that now the Middle East is about uh, the international migration, but this one, uh, uh, the, 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 the Chigese recruitment agency uh, was within the confines of the, uh, of the colonial Uganda. We also concluded that uh, labor shortage problem and labor recruitment persisted till the end of colonial era and not just a friction at the beginning when forced labor, uh, forced labor was rife. So ma major write-ups in this field indicate that uh, the labor shortage ended around 1937. And indeed, um, most of the reports that uh, uh, we accessed from uh, Africana uh, indicated that uh, uh, shortage of labor was no longer a problem. But as we can see from 1956, and here is the uh, 54, people trying to restrict the recruiters to come directly to Chigese district clearly indicate that labor shortage problem and labor recruitment uh, persisted up to the end of colonial labor. And for, from uh, this study, we also concluded that Ruwaro, or labor of Ruwaro kind, that an paid one persisted all through the colonial era, though it was treated in secrecy. And that migrant labor remains the main form of wage labor, and hence the importance of labor transit camps. And that uh, the recruiters such, uh, such as the Uganda company engaged in migrant labor recruitment and whoever did not follow that line of, uh, of contractual kind of arrangement was punished. We sincerely acknowledge 
remaking societies, remaking persons uh, for uh, financing or helping us perform this study. Then the Department of uh, uh, the Department of History, Archaeology, and Heritage Studies, Makerere University, and the University of Western Cape in South Africa, our dear participants who gave us this information, uh, all of you, physical and virtual audience, we thank you very, very much for the uh, uh, for listening to us. We look forward to your comments. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating presentation uh, and all of this material, really fascinating material that you've uncovered. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over directly to our discussant, uh, Professor Peterson, for his uh, questions and uh, comments. Yeah. So, of course, it's a pleasure to be asked to do this uh, service today. It's particularly a good opportunity for me to thank and acknowledge uh, Dr. Ruta Bajuka's longtime support for my own work as a historian here in Uganda. Uh, Dr. Ruta Bajuka was chair of the history department for a long time uh, during the time I was a research associate of this institution. And uh, his uh, welcome was always something that I look forward to when I've come here for the past 20 years now. So uh, now that you've retired <laughs> some, some years ago, but still it's a great opportunity for me to, to, uh, to, you know, to acknowledge your influence on me. So thank you. And also, of course, it's great to see Nicholas Tunanuche, and who I was, I saw I was here when you were doing your PhD defense, in fact, the last time, last year. So I'm, I'm also glad to see Nicholas at the very start of his career doing such interesting work. Among other things, this fascinating bit of research highlights the value of local government archives for historians and citizens of Uganda. Um, uh, in the past 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of energy put in to the cataloging and inventorying of local government archives, some of it under the um, incentives of the National Archives Service, some work done by students at my university and of this university, including this department. So the Kabale, the Kabale District Archive was inventoried about 10 years ago by a team from Kabale University and from Michigan. Uh, today, it sits in the attic above the local government headquarters outside Kabale town. It's one of several different local government archives that uh, students and researchers can access. And the kind of material that one can find in local government records like this is full of fascinating detail that's otherwise absent from archives located in government ministries or in uh, British archives. Local government archives uh, contain the papers of people who were very directly engaged in the work of of governing uh, people whose languages were not English, uh, whose way of uh, organizing their lives did not always accord with colonial or post-colonial officials' desires. And so one can see the actual negotiations and dynamics and uh, tensions that animated politics uh, outside the capital if you go to places like Lira or Fort Portal or Kabale, where local government archives open a window onto the much more complicated and vexed questions that animated politics in the first half of the 20th century. So to me, the, the issues, I, I, this paper is, 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 uh, is work in progress. And it seems to me that there are a number of questions that might guide Dr. Ruta Bajuka and uh, Dr. Tunanuche as they go forward. One thing to say, the first theme I want to kind of bring out of the first set of questions that I might pose to the two co-authors is this. Um, camps, these transit camps, among other things, were one of a series of carceral institutions by which Ugandan government officials tried by all means to distinguish Ugandan citizens from Rwandan foreigners. And it's worth saying that this was hard work because Rwandans and Banyachigezi are not by sort of definition separate people. The histories of Southern Uganda and Northern Rwanda are intimately interlinked over the long course of Eastern African history. And in the 19th and 20th century, those interlinkages caused all kinds of anxieties for British officials in Southern Uganda who regarded 
Rwandan's continuing influence on Southern Uganda's politics as a source of embarrassment and trouble. So you can think, for example, about Chief Nindo's residence in Southern Uganda during the course of World War I, during which this Rwandan dissident chief trying to escape from the Belgians chose to live in Uganda, in Uganda for some considerable amount of time as a means of uh, escaping a kind of colonial dragnet. One can think about the Nyabinji movement, a religious and political um, uh, what do you, movement might be, to, uh, uh, system of thought is perhaps the better way to think about it, that animated pu public life both in um, northern Rwanda and in southern Uganda, and that posed in the 1910s and 20s a deep and enduring challenge to the very fabric of local government in Chigezi. Uh, the Nyabinji devotees, in fact, stormed Kabale at one time, Kabale town, uh, in an effort to establish uh, their political and so uh, sovereignty. And managing the Nyabinji devotees, many of whom were Rwandan, was an enduring problem uh, for local government officials. So too uh, were Rwandan's uh, histories and economies interlinked through what we call labor migration, uh, in the 20th century, uh, something between a third and half of the people who lived in the kingdom of Buganda were from Rwanda or Sudan. Uh, the Chiganda culture, as uh, an expression of Chiganda identity, has always been interwoven with and defined in opposition to Banyarwanda presence, as um, as Baganda have sought to define themselves, or to, to, to distinguish their own citizenship and their own way of being in the world from Rwandan uh, workers, many of whom found the doors to Chiganda identity open and became Baganda, as they did indeed also become Banya Chigezi. In other words, these transit camps expressed British and later Uganda government officials' efforts to contain uncontainable things, to create lines between people who simply couldn't be uh, separated, to put up fences that regulated social life and that made people's movements predictable in a place where movement simply could not be uh, fenced off and so easily. Um, so um, one can think then about um, uh, refugee camps and transit camps on a kind of continuum, both of which are meant are directed to the to the kind of de containing of foreigners movements, their sexuality, their economy, their culture, to the creation of a kind of solid Ugandan entity. Um, and it's fascinating to hear Nicholas and Simon describe the, um, the different ways in which these transit camps became refugee camps, as you pointed out in your presentation. It's not as though these are separate things. These are these carceral institutions organizationally, politically, and kind of ideationally are part of the same system of, uh, or the same routines rather, not system, the same routines by which uh, government officials sought to contain uh, people's lives. So I, I, one thing, this is my first set of comments, one thing to say here is that I think a, a somewhat wider research itinerary that looked, that didn't simply regard the original identity of these places as transit camps, but rather looked at the onward course of buildings, of techniques, and of ways of thinking about identity over time, which would involve reading outside the transit camp files and at files that are to do with refugees and other such um, per persons, that this might yield a research agenda that would be richer and would deal with the kind of the the the, um, the afterlives or the the onward lives of buildings once defined to contain migrant laborers. So that's a kind of suggestion for an expanded research agenda. Linking up with point two which is to do with the enduring salience of camps more generally as a vehicle for managing Banya Chigezi politics and cultural life outside the context of Rwandan immigration. I don't know of any part of Uganda with the exception perhaps, no, I don't think that's uh, the Kanamajong have never really been settled in camps. Have, the, have, have there ever been more camps built for more purposes than in Chigezi? You think about refugee camps, you think about transit camps, and you think about the resettlement scheme, which involved the wholesale reorganization of Banya Chigezi uh, domestic life as people were sometimes by force, by Chief Ngologoza, as you point out, uh, Nicholas, shipped off to Toro or Ancole to inhabit sparsely inhabited parts of the country. This was you know, done in the name of relieving population pressure because colonial government officials thought it impossible that so many people could live in such a small place. And it's resulted in the diaspora of Banya Chigezi all over Uganda, a, a diaspora which was not really freely chosen, 
but was rather in many ways imposed on people who were obliged to live in places far distant from their their homes. Um, so an interesting question there here is to do with why have the Rwandan and Banyachigezi people of this part of Uganda been so much incarcerated? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it about that particular part of the country that's given uh, the carceral institutions such an important role? And I think there's something to do with a subject that you hint at, but th the fact remains that that unlike other parts of Uganda, Chigezi possessed um, sovereignty in its cuisine, in its, in its economy. That is, people could grow their own freaking food, and they did. The terraces that were so intrinsic to Chigezi's economy had been built before colonial government. And after colonial government, British officials basically stayed out of, out of the way of Chigezi uh, agroeconomy. Uh, food, food crops were the single most important economic, um, what do you call it, undertaking that Banya Chigezi uh, produced. The mines, were, of course, were consequential for colonial officials who wanted to create things that they could export. They didn't regard food as a profit-making crop. But for Banya Chigezi, the prevalence, the availability of cheap food was the, the kind of condition that made them in some ways sovereign and allowed them to live at the edges of these carceral routines that the British kept and later Ugandan officials kept coming up with. Um, so I think it's economic opportunity that underpinned the freedom, if we can put it that way, of people in this part of Uganda. Um, and that uh, that in some way allowed for the movement, uh, the, 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 that dynamic, the, almost the conference, the fact that there was so much labor shortage. I encourage you to think of this not as a problem um, that, um, which was how British officials saw it um, and later Ugandan officials, but rather as a social fact that reflected the availability of other opportunities, working in the mines, uh, and Wolfren or tin or gold or whatever other mines proliferated in this part of Uganda simply wasn't particularly attractive for people who had full stomachs and had options outside the mines that they could pursue. So a further avenue of research would be to answer the question, what was it that allowed um, both Rwandan and Banyachigezi people, not that they're separable, uh, to uh, live lives at a distance from these, these camps and other forms of uh, incarceration? Which brings me to the third question. I see this project, it's the way you've presented it, uh, um, both of you, as an incipient heritage project. There's a call in the PowerPoint and in your presentation here for memorialization, for the creation of a kind of infrastructure by which the these um, camps can be turned into sort of permanent evidence of Rwandan uh, people's um, migration. Uh, to me, this sounds great. I think that that, that I, I would, you know, um, having a heritage sector devoted to the memorialization of labor would be terrific, actually, because the heritage business, for reasons that um, we can discuss at a different time, has so often been framed around the memorialization of great uh, men, particularly kings. Um, having a heritage business located uh, meant to honor the work and sacrifice of uh, Banansi, whose sweat made modern Uganda outside the confines of palaces and kingdoms. This to me would be fantastic. And a, a heritage business oriented around Rwandan migration would also be wonderful. But the questions are to do with, you know, what to memorialize. Any heritage um, undertaking any monument always is a, a kind of freezing of a dynamic history. And as your paper shows, these sites have multiple lives. They're not simply fixed in place. There's multi, multi generation histories of incarceration and of escape that guided uh, the experience of people in these places. So it would be interesting for me to hear both of you reflect on what it would be, or what, whichever of you wants to, to reflect on what it would be that would be commemorated here. Do you see the um, commemoration of Rwandans uh, experience in camps as a kind of counter, um, a counter to hierarchical traditionalist definitions of culture? Is there something liberatory here? And if so, how do you capture it? 
So those are my three areas of, uh, of interrogation. Let me simply end by saying it's a pleasure to get to hear this project in its early stages and keep going. <laughs> Much you know if uh, if you want to tackle as much uh, of that as uh, as you want, uh, please uh, please go ahead before we open it up to questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Tawajuka, would you like to respond to some of those questions? And uh, well, uh, um, just to um. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Professor uh, Peterson, for um, uh, really opening up. Uh, I mean, in a way, um, context uh, helping us to think towards how to um, um, sum up and then uh, point towards uh, new um areas of uh, uh inquiry and the consolidation um i particularly um uh, feel um that uh, yes the um uh, these these labor camps um when you look at the colonial mind, you know, uh, as it comes through the literature, there is a lot that uh, um, is left out. The tensions, for example, uh, and the negotiations in the um, communities where uh, these workers would be uh, coming from, and uh, uh, the social histories that uh, uh, the, the, they were created around uh, these camps. Uh, on one hand, the colonialists were looking at um, uh, communities, uh, I mean, migrants as, as, as um, uh, untouched by the conditions that they faced. On the other hand, uh, creating these camps as uh, uh, centers for interaction. So that tension, I think, uh, becomes uh, uh, to us very, very important and useful, particularly when we come to think about uh, this issue of heritage, the memories, and uh, the communities. Uh, in During the research, uh, it became clear that uh, uh, the Banyarwanda question is extremely serious and important both in Uganda as documented by um, among others um, uh, uh, Richards uh, not as much in western Uganda in uh, Ankore and in Kigezi to the extent that uh, we suspect that one of the key informant for us in um, one of the key informants was uh, prob probably Munyarwanda who uh, who came, used the camp, and instead of proceeding to Buganda, you know, got out. So that identity is fluid, is decedent. He couldn't, um, he was able to tell us his relationship with uh, the Catholic Church in Nyamitanga, how it made him. But uh, so, we looked at uh, his uh, possession, a small plot within the municipality. And uh, when we tried to ask whether this is where he had, he had lived all the time, he was not comfortable answering that question. So that is, um, um, you know, something that needs to be, uh, to me, uh, teased out. And uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Peterson. Um, the issue of uh, um, uh, sovereign and food, uh, yes, definitely, it's a very, very important one. And uh, building on the work of uh, 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 Caswell, 
uh, who did uh, quite some extensive research on this. And uh, to realize that uh, it's just now that uh, South Kigezi, Kawale district, as it is known now, uh, the, the search for a cash crop is on. Uh, just recently, there was uh, uh, introduction of tea. Uh, so around Kabale, you see some tea plantations, but uh, it looks like people are actually beginning to approve them, to approve the tea. They, 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 they don't make much sense in, in, in there. I think they, they, they realize that uh, it's causing to cause, I mean, it's bound to cause uh, food shortage. So uh, the forests, you know, the tree planting, uh, although people are not uh, cutting down the, uh, they are decrying those who, the resident, I mean, the absentee uh, owners of these uh, plants, you know, people in the city, people in the, they are portion of land, they plant trees in order to keep the land. Those who are there uh, look at it as kind of wastage. So the issue of, uh, of food uh, is, 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 is very, very critical. And um, there is a, an MA student who is doing um, some research on uh, migration, not to within it gets itself, the people who migrated from um, um, from Kabale to North Kigezi to areas of Rujumbra, but specifically, and part of Chinchizi. And one of the findings is that, yes, they were able to make very significant inroads by planting new food crops, that is groundnuts, which were not growing in, in, in Kabale and millet. And the trade networks that evolved up to now around those. So uh, that's what I would uh, uh, comment on now about uh, um, the, the, the broader political economic questions uh, of the struggles between um, um, the colonial establishment and um, uh, the Nyindo Nyabingi. Uh, definitely, it is extremely interesting. In fact, there is uh, Dr. Pamela, who is this? Uh, I think we were, she was supposed to be in our department, but uh, ended up in agenda to do Kentaro. Yes, her work on, on Nyabingi, Nyabingi movement. We still need to reclaim, yes, Mahomes. And we, uh, we, we feel cheated that he, that work went down there. And uh, thanks, Professor Peterson. I think we need to get someone to 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 bring it back to, to us. Thank you so much. Um, oh yeah, to you. Uh, I think uh, much of the of the uh, questions raised by uh, Professor Peterson have been really handled by uh, uh, Dr. Ruta. So back to you. Great, so we now, we now can open uh, the discussion to the audience, both here and online. Um, if you have a question online, you can uh, just use the raise hand button or, uh, or type into the chat. Yes, uh, I see uh, Mikhail Dahas, uh, please uh, unmute and, and go ahead. Yes, hello. I, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much to uh, to the presenter and and both authors of uh, of the paper, uh, which I uh, I enjoyed a lot. Um, I spent some time in the in the district archives uh, after they had been catalogued by um, the students uh, under Peter Derek Peterson's guidance, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, and I saw so many interesting documents, and it's, it's exciting to see that uh, that you're onto them and uh, you're working with them to produce um, yeah, new knowledge, new narratives on uh, on a topic that, of course, has been studied uh, for a long time, starting with uh, with the work of uh, Audrey Richards back in the 
the late 1940s and early 1950s. Um, I've myself also published a paper on this some time ago in, uh, in, in, in the Journal of African History, focusing on uh, Rwandan labor migrants to, uh, uh, to Uganda. Um, so based on my own experience in the archive and, and, and the work I've done, I, I have a few questions uh, and, and, and comments, which I hope are helpful uh, uh, for you. Um, so first of all, uh, something about the conclusion that, that labor shortage was still an issue in, um, uh, in Uganda, or maybe more specifically in, uh, in Buganda, and, and also uh, on, the, on the plantations in, uh, in Toro in the 1950s. I would say that the nature of, uh, of, of this labor shortage became quite different in, in the 1920s. So before that, there, there weren't really any major uh, migrant flows um, uh, that had emerged yet. Uh, and from the 1920s onwards, we see these, these, these uh, labor flows. And, and uh, as was mentioned by, uh, uh, by Professor Peterson, Rwanda featured very importantly into these, uh, into these labor flows. So I would say that rather than talking about a situation of labor shortage, I would talk about a situation of dependence on migrant labor, which is a bit of a different story because uh, a lot of this, this labor was also voluntarily offering itself in, uh, in Uganda. Uh, so there was no formal recruitment happening in uh, Rwanda. Uh, Rwandans came to Uganda for a variety of reasons. Um, so I wouldn't call it labor shortage so much, maybe more dependence on migrant labor. But then I would also say that in the 1950s, we see uh, that, that the, the flow from Rwanda is subsiding a little bit. There's still many Rwandans crossing the border into, uh, into Uganda, both, both through uh, the Tanzania route and through the, uh, the Chigezi route. Um, but the numbers are, are going down. And I think this is maybe one of the reasons that explains why you see this very active recruitment of laborers in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Chigezi district. Right? I think this was something that, that was particular to the 1950s and it was related to the decline of uh, uh, the flow of Rwandan migrants. But this is a hypothesis. I, I'm not 100% sure if this is true, but that, that would be my sort of interpretation that that would be the explanation for, uh, for this. Um, yeah, so, and, and what I also found very interesting about your, um, uh, your talk, uh, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this uh, in, in response, uh, is, is that you mentioned that many, um, uh, many of the migrants, um, and I, I think you were referring to people from the Chigesi district, but maybe also Rwandans who travel through that area, uh, ended up actually um, uh, settling in, uh, in, in, uh, in Ankole, right? Uh, so they didn't actually make, make their way all the way to, to Uganda, and, and, and they settled down and, and married in, um, uh, in the Ankole region. So I, I find this very interesting, and I think this is a, um, um, an aspect of this labor migration, this labor mobility that has not been studied in, in much detail yet. So you, you, you find barely anything about this in the work of uh, Audrey Richards. Uh, I myself have, have paid no attention to it. So I, I think that is a very interesting aspect of, of sort of this Western migration route, and, and I would be very keen to learn more about it. So maybe this is something you can, uh, you can pursue a little bit more and not just focus on, on, on this well, fairly well-known story of integration of Rwandans in, uh, in, in, in Buganda society, but also in, in the Western region, and perhaps also people from the Western region moving to other parts of, of, of Uganda's Western um, region. Um, and then I, I just have a, a number of small points. Uh, I hope I, I can still make those. Um, uh, one would be that um, I know that the Uganda company actually bought some sugar, uh, sorry, some tea plantations in, um, in the Toro uh, uh, region in 1948 and 49. So this could perhaps explain why they became so active um, uh, in, in, in recruiting labor from, um, um, from, from the Chigesi, Chigesi district. Um, and I would also say that it could be interesting to engage a little bit with the work of uh, Grace Carswell. Uh, who has always argued, well, her argument is that, that um, uh, the people in this region were unwilling for a variety of reasons to, to grow cash crops because, and her main argument is that they, they were able to grow food crops as cash crops. But I've always felt that she really overplays this and she underestimates the fact that so many people from this region are actually not present, but away as migrants. And that also undermines your ability to grow cash crops. Um, so to, to better understand this and, and to understand why this area did not become a cash crop region, but um, a labor reserve, one could say, uh, could also be an interesting intervention in, uh, in, uh, in the literature. 
so these are just some uh, some 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 thoughts basically on uh, on the basis of your talk and, and thank you very much again thanks so much uh, I, could we should we take a, a couple and then uh, uh, I saw yes please uh, dr. Chima please uh, go ahead all right uh, am I obi Dibo? yeah thank you Thank you so very much. I want to thank uh, the discussants who has just uh, um, um, helped us uh, understand even more the presentation. Uh, I want to thank also the two historians who have taken on a very important project, uh, a project which has been dominated by uh, economic anthropologists and a little bit of economic historians in a way that um, uh, it has always missed the more interesting social bit of this history. And so uh, in in that token, I want to also push a little bit the two historians. Uh, rarely does a subject of interest like this can be taken up by two historians, um, let alone one. So uh, I heard from uh, Nicholas in his presentation about uh, these camps as, as particularly obsessed with the differentiation, uh, differentiation as a key characteristic between, I mean, those inside and those outside of them, keeping the camps as um, more, uh, uh, non-national in identity and those outside of them to be not contaminated. This seems to be a, 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 a fairly colonial uh, project um, uh, and perhaps a colonial intervention to, to see the camp, whether transit camps or the labor migration camps themselves and later on the refugee camps as, as, as perimeter walls of uh, differentiation. But could it, could it be a little more interesting for this project to step a little outside of the colonial temporal register and do a little bit of the pre-colonial uh, just just before the the british on the one side of the border and the belgian on the other side came to mess up what could have been perhaps dora kingdom dora kingdom um Nyingina kingdom in in today's rwanda and a little bit of dora kingdom in today's uganda uh, uh the fact that migration predates colonialism is an important fact here to remember and what that means is it gives us a chance to read how the migration was happening before the advent of the colonial states. My hunch, and I've not done research in that, I'm just borrowing from my own reading of um, historical towns like um, what we call today Kivito in Fort Portal uh, on the way to Kastese. I mean, my hunch is that this, tra this transit camp could have in the pre-colonial moment uh, met um, uh, 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 spaces of, um, of melting pots and, and colonialism comes in and creating and changing them fundamentally into spaces of differentiation. And so from, uh, from transit cup as melting points, melting of cultures, melting of, uh, uh, of, of many differences to, to becoming in colonial moments as a moment of highlighting difference is, is something uh, uh, worth uh, uh, presenting here or perhaps pointing to so that we know what is different and what is similar from the pre-colonial as we navigate as we navigate the colonial and the post-independence. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, do you want to respond to the, as, to those two and then we can uh, take another round uh, when you're done? Let's try one. Okay. Um, the um, question of uh, labor shortage in Uganda and uh, the the the, the um, differences or the changing patterns of uh, migrant labor labor flows. Uh, this is definitely a very very important point. But uh, um, when you look at uh, the literature, there is a lot of generalization. Uh, to the extent that uh, it's as if uh, um, at some point, particularly into the 40s, you know, interwar period and so on, the labor shortage problem uh, kind of ceased. But we go into uh, this, even in our own work, we, we fail prey to this generalization, uh, this so-called voluntary uh, flow of labor and uh, um, responding to economic opportunities, the cash nexus had uh, 
taken roots and uh, the need for bride wealth monetized and clothing and uh, so on. But uh, we get to um, the 50s and uh, uh, it becomes um, very, very clear that uh, this labor shortage problem uh, was actually persistent to the point that uh, recruitment gained more and more traction. Um, the, uh, there is uh, even um, um, an attempt to apportion to, 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 to stop recruitment for certain sectors and, uh, in, you know, privileging others. So, um, yes, I think it's a point that uh, is extremely important to think through particularly um, uh, to avoid uh, those generalities. And uh, um, yes, the issue of um, uh, migrant uh, settlement in Angkore and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, in fact, this is uh, again, something that uh, uh, is usually glossed over. There is a tendency to look at uh, uh, Banyarwanda, uh, Banyarwanda in Uganda as refugees, as people who um, were forced, you know, out of their country after, in, you know, towards independence, after independence. So the contribution of migrants eh, to the presence of Banyarwanda in very, very large numbers is sometimes overlooked. And when it is, uh, um, you know, accepted as, you know, uh, to look at uh, Buganda. And uh, um, the evidence shows that uh, actually in route back, they would, using some of the earnings, uh, try to get some land and settle along, along there. Uh, so um, I think um, that's, uh, uh, important and useful. And then uh, uh, Dr. Shima. Okay. Yes, uh, as historians, uh, we we really appreciate your comment on uh, the connection between uh, uh, pre-colonial migrant patterns and, um, um, you know, what migrants became later. But uh, you realize that um, the pre-colonial uh, was uh, probably more, more complex in the multiplicity of, of causes, environmental um, disease, uh, conflicts. But the colonial, maybe that's what we need to you know, to, to tread on a little bit more carefully, to, to, to nuance it a little more, that uh, to reduce it to just one single economic compulsion might probably be something we want to rethink, that there were um, uh, migrations that were not necessarily a result of um, just uh, pure and simple economic target and, and so on. Yeah, um, he has uh, raises a very uh, important element of uh, the story of integration of the Rwanda in Uganda, uh, which we of course uh, uh, point to and uh, was pointed on by uh, uh, Richards. Uh, as we mentioned, this was the time when also Richards was doing her, her research, that is 1950s uh, in Uganda here. And uh, sh she reported uh, the integration of very many Banyarwanda uh, failing to return back uh, to, to Rwanda, but also trying to acquire land in Uganda as tenants. Uh, we 
discussed uh, uh, about it and how uh, whether it uh, it actually influenced uh, the re uh, more recruitment or the the acute lack of uh, labor laborers in Uganda or something of some sort. Um, but as uh, uh, Dr. Tawajuka has mentioned, there are two sets of the Banyarwanda migration, which we would need as uh, historians to appreciate. Uh, and uh, it is also popping up, it has popped out uh, in Uganda as regards to citizenship question. Uh, the Banyarwanda who migrated before 1949, who have been called Banyarwanda as part of a, a, a scenic category in the Uganda's population. Uh, the, 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 the remnants or the, the, those ones that uh, are bold enough to call themselves so would want to shift from uh, being Banyarwanda to Bavandimwe. And these are quite far different from the refugee question, uh, these that are uh, out of the conflicts that took place in Rwanda. Uh, in other words, the voluntary ones who came in and integrate, those which uh, 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 Peterson has uh, uh, named, uh, named as the Baganda, because actually now you cannot tell the difference and probably uh, you can only tell uh, the difference at uh, night hours or uh, uh, um, at the drinking places when they turn back to their language. Mm -hmm. uh, so all those are the issues to really ponder with to which this study wishes to question, question and question. And through uh, these uh, camps, both recruitment camps and the transit camps uh, really try to bring to the fore uh, and unpack those historical trajectories. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, see a... I see a question from uh, Dr. Kisa online. I don't know if you'd want to ask it uh, directly or just uh, have our, please go ahead, yeah. Oh, I can, I uh, hope you can hear me. Good to see you, yeah. Hi, hi, yeah, it's early morning here. <clears throat> it's good to, be up early and join this uh, very fascinating uh, talk and project by Simon and Nicholas. Yeah, I just had a quick question about, you know, what what was it about in PG that made it um, sort of a terminus point for the migration track, um, which also ties into uh, sort of um, I don't know whether the camps do help us, um, you know, uh, get get a different understanding of the kinds of circuits of uh, capitalist accumulation that were taking place, especially in late, late colonial Uganda. That sort of uh, two quick questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I, I have, sure, and, and I, I have myself on the list as well, and, but he's uh, Dr. Kanaku. Okay. Uh Okay, um, here we go. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicholas and Dr. Tawajuka. I know this started as a, a small project, but it seems to have grown into something really big and and, and very interesting. And of course, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peterson, again, for the very uh, interesting issues that, that you raise. So I, I, I have uh, really, really small comments. Um, in your presentation, Nicholas, you talked about the sub-county chiefs playing a very crucial 
uh, role in the recruitment of labor. And I was just wondering, what about the chiefs below the subcount chiefs? Uh, again, in the indirect rule system and administrative structure that 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 we know, I would, I would want to hear a little bit more about what is it exactly that the sub county chiefs were doing that um, the chiefs below them did not do, or were those that are insignificant? And then. To I so this recruiting agencies <laughs> uh, again it's very interesting how you know like all, all this were, were were put together and um, I was fascinated by what you said that uh, the district commissioner uh, seemed to be uh, very strict on which agency recruited what kind of 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 labor and I, so, so I would have wanted to hear a little bit more about um, what is it that pushes these concerns of the of, of, of the district commissioner, something which maybe takes you back in uh, sort of looking at the, 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 the objectives or the intentions of these uh, colony authorities in having these different um, recruiting agencies established in in the different in the different places. Um, and then I yes so again about the same recruiting agencies I would I would want to hear a little bit more about uh, what what actually happened in the camps what was you know the administration like what what were the dynamics um, because these are not just sort of like pulling uh, or points where you pull together the labor and then tomorrow you come I mean it's not it's you cannot uh, equate them to points of collection of cash crops, for example, where you know all the coffee is collected here and then it's moved to the next point of you know uh, destination. So for these camps, um, you could have said this maybe. I mean, you might have said this, and maybe I missed it. But but what exactly happened? So the labor, especially, you call them the transit. This yeah, the transit camps. Yeah. So bring all this labor from wherever and now it's in the transit camp um what 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 happens there i don't know if your sources allowed you to to get to that and lastly um gender dynamics i know <laughs> i just want to hear again a little bit a little bit more so this this labor is essentially um it's just it's 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 just it's just men it's like I, I want you to speak a little bit to the gender dynamics in all this. Thank you. And I did uh, Arthur George Kamia. Did you have your hand raised, or if you'd like to ask a question? Uh, hi, no. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, sorry, no. I was actually about to ask about gender. I mean, just demographics. Maybe I missed that. I mean, was it all young men? you know, between what ages and what does that tell us about sort of, you know, masculinity or what, you know, what, 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 what were the gender dynamics of, 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 of the camps and, and, I, you know, in terms of, you know, men sort of, you know, self-expression, that kind of thing. Um, also, I'm from Kochi, um, right near Liantonde, so, um, so I have a self-interest in now, you know, maybe something about sort of the camp in Liantonde, maybe some of my ancestors were from there, but you know, if there's any information about it, I'd be I'd love to hear it. Thanks. Thank, thank you. And, uh, and let me, I'm going to add, I know there's a lot there, but I'm going to add my own question uh, and then you can choose what to respond to <laughs> uh, um, on this round. I, so for me, I'm going to say something very out of character, but I, I uh, what I found actually fascinating about the, what you the work you've done so far is actually a bit even outside of the archive or rather maybe uh, pairing the archive with your visits to the actual sites that you found described uh, and so I'm gonna you know coming back to I think the third point from Professor Peterson about heritage what's interesting is that there sort of is a kind of memorialization uh, around these sites. I mean, you describe Ruti site being today being referred to as Agaba Banyarwanda. Uh, um, and so people are, 
are and whether they're referring to it as you know a, have a knowledge about a history of a camp there's a history of the kind of divisive work that the camp was doing these are Banya Rwanda, these are Banya Kigezi, these are Baganda. That kind of work is being uh, done in kind of the memorialization of these sites today by people who live around them, at least in this one case, it sounds like. So it, you know, it comes back to the question of if what would a, you know, what would be the contribution of historians in memorializing these sites as something different? Because in actually, in Dr. Rudabajuka, in your when you were discussing the the man who had settled, who when you asked about where he was from, he sort of he backed away. Uh, that history, probably a much more common history of uh, people defying these easy, you know, these categories, whether ethnic categories uh, or categories of who is of this was voluntary migration, this person is a refugee, this person is an economic migrant, this person is a, uh, uh, you know, a voluntary migrant. Those categories often mean uh, less and less as, as you know, or, they're, or they have very specific personal meanings for the individuals involved. Um, and so I wonder as historians then, it's like, what would a memorialization of the much more common practice of integration or social um, fluidity look like? Because for the people who engaged in it, it often has to be silent, except as Nicholas said, maybe around a drinking uh, at night when you're drinking, it sort of comes out in sort of linguistic differences or, uh, but it's something it seems very difficult. Like, how do you memorialize something that was not meant to be monumental. The camp was meant to be monumental because it was meant to contain, but it, as we see, it kind of fails. You know, the camp is porous. <laughs> it doesn't prevent people from becoming Baganda or, or becoming this kind of migrant or that kind of migrant. So what, as historians, and we're thinking about something that is, the people who were asking about it aren't telling us, oh yes, I, I, I was this and now I'm this because I I integrated or whatever. It's something that's silent in the interviews. How do we make that, I mean, or do we make that, how do we make that visible in our research? But if we're going to celebrate that in some way or at least memori memorialize it, what would that even look like? Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot uh, there, but um, can pick what to what to respond to uh, as you choose. Okay. Um, uh, yes, uh, Moses. Uh, good to uh, see you. To uh, uh, hope you are doing well there. Um, the 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 issue of um, PG uh, was uh, site. Uh, that one. Um, is not it uh, very um, uh, vivid uh, because uh, we are yet to find an opportunity to map uh, the MPG camp. Uh, but uh, um, uh, it is very likely to be um, a, a transit camp. It's uh, where people, because it's along the, the route and um most likely it wasn't uh, as much of a recruitment camp uh, the issue of uh, capitalist accumulation of course it's uh, extremely important and uh, useful we always have to uh, want to remind ourselves that uh, um these were imperatives of uh, um uh capital accumulation based on um, cheap labor to to have labor as cheap as it could be less, less troublesome as it could be and um, uh, flowing in a uh, controlled numbers so that um, um, uh, it 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 doesn't uh, cause um, 
um, some uh, social discontent, uh, both uh, in areas where it is uh, flowing and where it is coming uh, from, connecting now with Dr. Uh, with uh, Professor Peterson's uh, question about uh, food production, because in the colonial literature, much as uh, there was obsession with the export crops, there was worry about uh, um, uh, uh, communities uh, continuing to be uh, self-sufficient. This being possible in more in some places and not others. I remember in my own work coming across the concerns in Aru in West Nile, where diets were changing because uh, labor too much of the labor was flowing out. So instead of millet, they were beginning to rely more on cassava, which was not as nutritious. So um, uh, Moses, uh, this question of capital accumulation is definitely very, very important. And uh, it is always at the back of our mind. Um, uh, Dr. Kanakwa, this is really very, very uh, spot on the question of um, uh, the chiefs, I think Nicholas, uh, we'll have to um, go back and look at uh, the role of the Batong. Uh, in, in the case, they also called Batong Leo Bakungu. You know, this is the Chiganda model that had been exported. And uh, um, where from the um, popular, um, the, the popular language, these were. Uh, Actually, they, they, they most they were the ones uh, really involved in um, in this process, particularly the Ruaro labor. Um, so the Ruaro chiefs definitely were very very critical. But uh, when it comes to documentation, uh, they didn't have. Uh, I mean, they they they, they want uh, they were communicating. I think through the the, the sub county chief. Uh, what we also found extremely fascinating, and we shared with uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Teira and uh, Dr. Kanakwa, was that um, uh, the chiefs, the, 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 the chiefs, the um, uh, sub county chiefs, and uh, the county chiefs were communicating to the district commissioner in pencil. They are, they are writing uh, in pencil, uh, not in ink. And we kept wondering why these notes are in pencil. They come, this DC writes in ink, they reply, respond in pencil. And uh, we also uh, take it, but we thought that the pencil writing can fade and what are we, but it is as fresh as the, the ink, as the ink, even more. So uh, uh, the, the, the lower chiefs were not uh, communicating in writing, but uh, um, they, um, they alluded to in the, the, their work. Uh, then um, uh, the, the, the recruitment, and the, rest, the restrictions to um, where the labor can go and where it can't. I think this one we will have to go back to see, to, 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 to digest the, this information through analysis. But uh, um, there was, of course, the uh, plantations, uh, maybe, um, the worry was that uh, the plantations were already uh, concentrating on West Nile labor, and uh, they, they would rather remain, I mean, with that and not encroach on. Um, um, because when you look at uh, the literature, there is, um, uh, they, 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 there is a lot of you and cry about. Um, uh, you know, so much to be done, and yet the labor coming out is is not 
as uh, as much and there is also the issue of uh, desertion so um uh, there was an attempt to develop the local economy mining and uh, and and um particularly mining in Buchimbiri, in Bufundra, and in Rwanda. And uh, so the district commissioner at Gezi was really concerned that those should be allowed to have as much labor as, and you know that mining labor is always very difficult. It is very tenuous and it attracts uh, few and fewer people. So, I think those were some of the concerns. And uh, Nicholas, I think uh, I'll uh, pass on this issue of uh, the dynamics in the camps. And uh, um, well, of course, the issue of gender, the issue of gender continues to, po to, uh, to, uh, to pop up, but uh, uh, in terms of recruitment, the focus was on the male. Uh, the, the the young men but uh, in the records particularly labor from rwanda we see reference to women and children using the camps and um, so it's quite intriguing whether these were um, uh, um, uh, wives and children of uh, the men who had already become tenants in Uganda and elsewhere, uh, kind of bringing their families, or uh, we have instances where women were also becoming laborers. Yeah, again, this one is not um, is much generalization about uh, uh, migration focusing on men, but that those references we have to dig up and see what they actually meant. The camps. I mean, yeah. Yeah. dynamics say uh, that the camps. What happened at the at, at, uh, at the camp for for the one at Kavare? Uh, it was in two ways. Camps, uh, the, the camp was a quite vast uh, area with uh, a number of houses made of aluminium, the ones you, uh, uh, we, we know as the inputs, inputs uh, as, I, I, as I described. So, those were set and uh, they were made uh, to ensure that or in the context of having the migrant laborers spending a uh, quite less time. So the contracts, uh, when the, the idea of the contracts came in, 19, uh, in 1950s, uh, when the question of uh, escapism, the, the, the question of desertion came in, one would, would come, sign a contract in which uh, the contract would specify where you are going, whether it was Kirembe, whether it was uh, uh, Buganda, whether it was Toro, uh, given, uh, given the prices and uh, the unexpected work, the, the, the labor force one had to engage in. Um, employers in Chirembe uh, had quite much more uh, incentives compared to uh, the Baganda and that in uh, uh, in uh, tea plantations in Toro. 
So there was always the tendency of, uh, uh, of many uh, migrant laborers signing for Kirembe. Uh, but when they would reach there and find that actually the work was so tedious, they would uh, divert at times or when they, uh, when they return, instead of returning through the camp, because there were lorries and uh, 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 lorries that would transport and bring back, especially at uh, what they called Noel, the Christmas period. So instead of coming through the camp, they would divert and use another channel. They would join those ones using a, a foot. And the role of the chief now becomes very, very critical because in writing them, they would capture both names of the individual, individual young man, uh, because uh, uh, this one was the particularly a, 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 a young man's work of about 18 to 30 years. Uh, the parent, the parent's name, uh, of, uh, we, we have those, some of those uh, names, uh, we, we would see them in archives and uh, uh, also corroborated with the the narratives of uh, uh, these uh, participants, then they would also write the specific villages where they came from and the, the Gomborra chief who in, in, the, in the current language uh, or, or, or who um, who recommended because they had to be tested the fitness, whether uh, the, 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 the person was able to really do the work or will instead waste uh, 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 Scuddy's transport. <laughs> yeah. Because you, uh, 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 if the person was not fit, then it would mean that uh, what had been put into uh, uh, the, 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 the laborer did not bring out the product uh, of, the, of the employer, of the employer's expectations. So to avoid all that, the DC provided for uh, the, 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 the physical fitness checkup uh, days before reaching the camp. Then after, uh, after the, the checkup, it was the duty of the Gomorra chief to inform those that turned up for uh, the checkup to now either mobilize if they were about 20 or so, then they would qualify for a, a, a role. A, 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 popularly known as a rubao. If they did not reach 20, then it would mean that they had to walk from say Buhaya or uh, 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 Rubanda and so on and come to the camp by themselves with their packed food because at the camp they did uh, uh, they provided uh, uh, a simple uh, simple meals in preparation for uh, for on board or for boarding and uh, uh, um, some bucket toilet within the camp so sanitation was really <laughs> A, 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 a major problem, but uh, 
as time would go on, uh, SCAD as an administrator would keep on improving, improving. So the camp was a really a busy, a busy space for to and from uh, migrant laborers. Of course, they differentiated. They differentiated the the recruitment camp from uh, the transit camp. That one uh, uh, was called uh, the Verera, and the other uh, uh, near near the school, and that was particularly for Banyarwanda who were still using food. Uh, that element of Agabanya Rwanda at, uh, at uh, Luti uh, was quite now different from uh, the Kavari one. That of uh, Agabanya Rwanda, there were no vehicles like those of, uh, of SCAD. So it was like a rest place. So you, uh, um, and uh, interaction was not really limited to any, uh, uh, was not limited, was not limited. There was free entry and exit, but of course there was writer. That is regarding what happened within those camps. Uh, sorry, um, I uh, I intended to come back to your question, although uh, just to acknowledge uh, its significance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because um, uh, we 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 found we found out that um, uh, some of the would-be respondents were a bit hesitant because um, this issue of identity is still quite uh, serious. And uh, you had to get people coming out to describe in detail how they are, they, they, you know, their they background yeah. and heritage. But um, we hope that uh, we can um, try to um, map out uh, these tensions and um, and see. Um, I mean, these memories. Will, as far as they can go, uh, as I mean, because if we have a place known as, for example, Agawanya Rwanda, is this some kind of laboring? Is this some kind of ownership? Those yeah. that is, is this some kind of belonging? So we will try to construct some narratives around this, and then see. Uh, kinds of categories mm -hmm. that uh, really uh, use these uh, um, these terms and how far uh, they can go. Otherwise, we also found that uh, the camps were not just, they, 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 they were not uh, restric restricted that uh, once in, then you couldn't get out until full documentation or something like that. It's the first thing, Dr. Ruta Bajuka, that the South Africans have been, especially people at UWC, have been involved in building museums and labor camps for some time now. There's a one outside Cape Town called Lawandle Labor Camp that a man named Leslie Witz has written about. He's at UWC, in fact. And it's a very interesting museum. They've, they've taken migrant labor as the subject of the museum. Um, and tried to create an institution that reflects on the experience of migrant laborers and honors them 
uh, as part of, I mean, South Africans are very creative in their efforts to memorialize hidden struggles in a way that the heritage business in East Africa hasn't really pursued. And there's something there about how, that gets to Edgar's question about how to memorialize um, the experience of cultural creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great insight to us. Yeah. And I, I saw that Professor Musisi had the uh, hand raised, but I, I don't know if you want to ask, uh, are still there and... I am still here, but in the interest of time, maybe I'll forego my uh, question. No, 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 Professor Musisi, so we have the time to hear the question. <laughs> no, we have to hear <laughs> We have to hear, this is the most important question in the interest of time. Oh, okay. Uh, first, uh, first of all, thank you very much, David and uh, Nicholas, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And I want to thank you also, David, and your students for all the intellectual and physical labor in making sure that we have these kinds of archives available to us and, and, and our students. Uh, um, my question, like, definitely as expected would have been on gender so i, I i'm really still not convinced with your answer on uh, you know like the, the the about gender if those lists have women and children you have to have a gender analysis you have to include what are these women and children doing you know like and and how are they related to labor otherwise you fall in the trap of homogenizing labor and migrant labor as male, you know, like, and, 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 and so we lose all the nuances of, of what labor meant and what migrant labor meant and how we can see labor differently from how, say, for example, Audrey Richards would, would have written about this labor in the late 1940s and, and uh, 1950s. Okay, so my question uh, is, Nicholas, on your last uh, slide, you talked about, you know, like, um, uh, there is reference to punishment. I would have wanted to know, you know, like, Hello? Sorry, uh, we, we, lost, uh, we lost you just as you were asking, uh, asking Nicholas a uh, question. Okay, okay, so, so I don't know how much you lost, but I, I guess, you know, like, uh, it, it's about the, it's about the, the punishment or punishments. Uh, what were these punishments? How were they enforced? And how effective were they? Thank you uh, very much for that. For that. Uh, for the, for those uh, questions. And I don't know if you, uh, Nicholas and uh, Simon, if you want to risk um responds uh to that before uh before we close now so um thank you very much uh professor um, Sisi. um we are so um um delighted to hear this issue of gender coming back um uh yes i think it's a, it's something that we will have to go back to and um um and ask about these children these women and children who 
who were reported in these camps and uh, whether they um, um, became part of the uh, labor force. Uh, reading um, um, Richard's work on uh, um, tenant labor, it becomes a little more uh, easier to see the women and uh, some extent children playing a role in this. Uh, for um, the male migrants in uh, on shambas in uh, mines, um, it becomes a bit, uh, you know, we'll have to check and see whether some women were also part of this and then uh, somehow they were, they silenced their, their, their work, their contribution is not owned. Uh, on uh, punishments, I think uh, uh, there is, um, uh, these are a bit elusive. Uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, worry about, um, uh, this is specifically refers to the deserters. Uh, so far, what we see is uh, um, reluctance by the chiefs to follow up on these deserters. And uh, um, so the, um, the, the, I don't know, Nicholas, what you, you, you have there in terms of, um, um, uh, there, there is talk about uh, hunting them down and putting them in prison, but we don't seem to see anyone actually being uh, grabbed and put in prison. Um, that is uh, um, uh, from the literature in, on recruitment and uh, in the camps. Uh, but uh, um, in general, of course, uh, um, uh, the, the, there were punishments meted out to um, migrant workers, who, including withholding their pay and so on. But that is from uh, um, you know literature. Yeah, uh, we also saw some elements of uh, uh, those who were doing it for the first time uh, uh, given some strokes. Uh, they were recorded, the number of strokes in the archives, uh, uh, they, they would say, uh, so and so from this and this Gomborora, uh, uh, and then the number of strokes usually they were six and 20. Mm. Uh, if those ones who deserted for the first time, and, uh, uh, the, and they, then they would be left, but uh, appeared to go back. And uh, and uh, and finish their contract, or seriously warned that if such contracts uh, are breached again, then uh, they would be imprisoned. But uh, as uh, I, I don't know it, uh, whether it was because of the Ubuntu or the Africaniste, in most cases. Uh, those Gombora chiefs <coughs> would pretend not to have seen the culprit and then ignored there and there. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you very much to uh, our presenters, our discussant, to our audience, both here and online, for your time and attention. Uh, this has really been a, a wonderful discussion of. Uh, uh, an exciting project, um, and uh, I know we're all looking forward to seeing uh, uh, what more comes uh, from this research um, using local archives, interviews. Uh, it's really a, a fantastic, and we're very grateful again uh, for for the presentation. So, yeah. Uh,
And I just want to close by saying that this is the first of uh, our series for the year. I'm still, we're still finalizing the uh, uh, ex uh, exact schedule, but I wanted to try to share uh, just the first part, which is mostly finalized. Uh, you can see on the screen, I hope um, some of our upcoming seminars uh, uh, for the next two months. Uh, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing uh, many of you there. Uh, if for any reason any anyone online uh, is wants to get uh, an announcement, uh, or if you're not getting an email from me with the announcements, uh, you can just put your email in the chat, and I'll I'll get it and add you to the list. Uh, so thank you to everyone, uh, and I uh, hope to see you uh, at our next seminar. Thank you. Thank you.